The second angel's message um, is a short message. Have you noticed that? It's just one verse. Um, so I've titled this Babylon Stumbling Stone and Rock of Offense implications of the second angel's message. The second angel's message is there for a reason. It's not just, you know, a passing warning. There's, there's some depth to it. So I'd like to have us explore today. And there's two texts that, well, they're obviously the text itself. Another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, verse 8, that is the second angel's message. And uh, that's small type, that's small font there, but Isaiah 8, 14, you're familiar with. He will be a sanctuary. Who is that? He, Jesus Christ, will be a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How are these linked, you might ask? Well, I think that will become clear as we, as we go on. Let's look at this second angel's message, kind of break it down into its parts here. Another angel followed. Another angel followed what? The first angel's message. So this angel is joining the first angel angel bringing additional information and um, giving a warning and the warning is regarding Babylon what is Babylon religious confusion, religious confusion. Um, that's one of the standard interpretations and then you've probably heard the idea I think it comes from an Aramaic word that's also Closely related, uh, closely related, and that is the gate of the gods, bab -El. Maybe you've heard people present on that. Of course, if you're trying to reach God by your own efforts, you're going to end up confused. Is fallen is fallen. Now, we could look at this one of two ways. The Bible uses repetition for emphasis. Verily, verily, Jesus would say, I say unto you, truly, truly. So that's one aspect. Babylon is irretrievably confused. <laughs> uh, I also think uh, perhaps in the context of what we read in Isaiah, this idea that there's a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and we'll look in a moment uh, at, at that in, uh, from a different, uh, couple of different angles, several different angles. So you can trip and fall or you can fall off a cliff. So there, there's, there's, um, there are degrees of falling, if you would say. So that, that's another idea. That great city, great in whose eyes? The, their own eyes, right? Greatness, what is true greatness? That, that is an element in this text as well. Has made all nations drink, has made What's that? Action? What kind of action? Forceful action. And what has Babylon made all nations drink? The wine of the wrath of her fornication. Wine representing teachings. Um, it, Christ said, this is my blood. So not just teachings, but also an experience that that teaching brings about. The wrath of her fornication, wrath being, well, yesterday morning's presentation. What is wrath? What is that fire? Um, what, what brings destruction? Things to think about. Of her fornication, what is God's relation to his people? What has he called us to? He's called us to this commitment that he's made to us, the marriage covenant where he wants to be one with us, to dwell in us. So what is fornication in that context? trying to have or replicate or reproduce or supplant that experience with something else. Something that we think might be better than that. 
So with those thoughts in mind, let's look at uh, this idea of what's happening in the second angel's message uh, from a, several, a few different angles. First of all, historicist. And so when, we, when I say historicist, I'm talking about the Adventist pioneers. Y many of you may or may not know the reformers. Most of them viewed prophecy in this sequential fashion called historicist, uh, the historic historicist reasoning. Now we have, in the Counter-Reformation, we have preterism, we have futurism, attempts to um, deflect that view. But the Adventist pioneers, the Millerites, the reformers that came before that, um, the people who started this movement that the Lord raised up were historicists. So when they saw what was happening, the first angel's message uh, was the initial call that Jesus is coming soon, get ready, it's a time of judgment. You recall that? The second angel's message, anyone recall what that was? Or how, how they saw that? So the message came, the Adventists, before there were any Seventh-day Adventists, there were Adventists who believed Jesus was coming soon based on the time of judgment uh, that was seen in Daniel uh, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, those things that were being studied that Miller was teaching. And so what they saw was something similar. There was a message being proclaimed, a warning message. Who was Babylon in this context? It was the people who, who were conf either confused or they felt they already had it. It says self-exalting or we could say self-confident. We already have the truth. We don't need this. Don't bother us with the m message of Jesus soon return. Uh, we're fine, thank you. And when they rejected the Advent message to our early pioneers, what they viewed was this warning of the second angel was to these people. Babylon, this confusion, this rejection of the Advent message is, um, is going to bring a fall. And indeed, there's evidence from history. Um, I'm not going to quote all of these, but they the Adventist pioneers bring out the declension that actually happened in the Protestant churches, quoting the, the Protestant ministers and people of influence in Protestantism about how bad things were getting in the churches around this time. And the Adventists understood this, this was a fall that was happening because of rejection of the, the message that was given in the first angel's message. Uh, the... Many of these churches, in fact, uh, you may be familiar, Ellen White was a member of a Methodist church. What happened to her and her family? They were disfellowshipped. So Babylon resorts, when, this, when the messages are rejected, Babylon resorts to force, coercion, and uh, they are en enjoying um, this experience that they think is good enough, but it's actually a corrupt experience. It's not true worship. So here's, here's um, James White, and I'm just going to share this with you. You can uh, read along here. The second angel's message has also been fulfilled. This is James White writing after 1844. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, etc. The angel does not proclaim his message at the time of the first, but follows after. It's a well-known fact that the burden of the first message was given from 1840 to the first part of 1844. It is also a fact that the announcement Babylon has fallen was made in 1844 and that the burden of that message which called many thousands from the different churches closed in the autumn of 1844. This movement being local, the angel is not said to make his proclamation with a loud voice. Interesting, the first and the third angel are made with a loud voice but not the second. So that's his interpretation there. But the first angel announces the hour of God's judgment with a loud voice. The fulfillment was a mighty movement which took hold of the public mind. The solemn announcement of the third angel is made with a loud voice. And this is the period of the preparatory work of another mighty movement in fulfillment of the third angel's message. And he wrote that in 1853 uh, in Signs of the Times. The cause of the fall of Babylon, I believe this is him still uh, we're quoting. Uh, I'll give you the reference at the end. The, the cause of the fall of Babylon is said to be because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Her fornication was her unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. The wine of this is that with which the church has intoxicated the nations of the earth. There's but one thing to which this can refer, and that is false doctrine. 
So teaching. Of course, false doctrine leads to an experience because what we teach, what we believe about God is how we experience or influences how we experience our relationship with him. This harlot, in consequence of her unlawful union with the powers of earth, has corrupted the pure truths of the Bible and with the wine of her false doctrine has intoxicated the nations. As a few of the gross errors which she has caused the masses to receive as Bible truth, we mention the following. So the Adventist church, Adventist movement, views itself as a culmination of the Reformation. God is calling the people to restore Bible truth, and he goes on to list several of these. So the immortality of the soul uh, being one of the errors, uh, sprinkling and pouring or baptism, so restoring baptism, the Sabbath Sunday issue, the millennium being, you know, pre-millennialists. Uh, Adventists um, saw that in the scripture as opposed to this, uh, mil you know, earthly millennium. And that the heaven is a real place. Uh, the second advent uh, is not simply spiritual, but it's, it's real. And... So the other errors they were uh, combating, it was right and that it was not right to hold human beings in bondage. So slavery was actually something that was uh, right there at the cusp of Adventism, seeing this is not right. And uh, the last one he lists here, it's of no consequence if we may judge from their practice to come out and be separate from the world. So that is, of course, Babylon's wine. Just stay here, have a drink, be comfortable. Things are fine. He goes on. Most of these pernicious errors, Protestant sects have themselves originated, showing conclusively that they are but the daughters of the great apostasy. The truths connected with the proclamation of the first angel were calculated to correct many of the fundamental errors of Babylon and open reception of the whole truth in place. Uh, I'm sorry, and open the way for reception of the whole truth in place of her false doctrines. That these errors were honestly held by different churches is not to be questioned, but... After light has been given to a person sufficient to enable him to discard the error, he becomes guilty for longer retaining it. So when Babylon, through the proclamation of the first message, was called upon to correct her errors and redeem her influence over the people and refused to do so, she then became guilty of willfully refusing the truth and making the nations intoxicated with her false teaching. And that was written uh, 15 years later as he's looking back in this reference, which is uh, Life Incidents. L-I-F-I-N, life incidents, connection with the great Advent movement as illustrated by the three angels of Revelation 14. So he wrote this uh, exposition of the three angels' messages as it related to the Adventist experience uh, around 1844. So the early church uh, leadership saw, or the members saw, Babylon as apostate Protestantism, arising, of course, the teaching arising from Babylon which as we know in scripture, Paul, uh, perhaps Peter, uh, Babylon was code word for Rome. So we, we see that connection. So Ellen White and the Great Controversy, this is 1888 version of the Great Controversy. She actually um, expounds on this a little more, but from a little different angle. And, and she says this, And why were the doctrine and preaching of Christ's second coming so unwelcome to the churches? While to the wicked the advent of the Lord brings woe and desolation, to the righteous it is fraught with joy and hope. This great truth had been the consolation of God's faithful ones through all the ages. Why had it become, like its author, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? Do you see the link? So now we see those two texts linked, the second angel's message and Isaiah 8.14. The message of the second coming had become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to his professed people. It was our Lord himself who promised his disciples, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. It was the compassionate Savior who, anticipating the loneliness and sorrow of his followers, commissioned angels to comfort them with the assurance that he would come again in person even as he went into heaven. Okay, so the message is not simply an idea, Jesus is coming. It's actually to draw on the heart because it's Jesus who's coming. <laughs> the one that, that we love and that loves us and cares for us. So this is how the, the message was given to the disciples. And she's 
describing in the great controversy this what happened around 1844 this message should have been widely accepted and rejoiced in but the message itself of Jesus soon return became a stumbling stone and a rock of offense she goes on as the disciples stood gazing intently upward to catch the last glimpse of him whom they loved their attention was arrested by the words "Ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven the same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven hope was kindled afresh by the angel's message the disciples returned to, to Jerusalem with great joy and continually in the temple praising and blessing God they were not rejoicing because Jesus had been separated from them and they were to be left to struggle with the trials and temptations of the world but because of the angel's assurance that he would come again the proclamation of Christ's coming should now be as when made by the angels to the shepherds of Bethlehem good tidings of great joy those who really love the Savior cannot but hail with gladness the announcement founded upon the Word of God that he in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered is coming again not to be insulted despised and rejected as, as his first advent but in power and glory to redeem his people it is those who do not love the Savior that desire him to remain away and there could be no more conclusive evidence that the churches have departed from God than the irritation and animosity excited by this heaven sent message what message is she talking about Christ coming but the principle of a heaven sent message that should warm our hearts uh, I think that that stands out and this almost goes without saying those who accepted the Advent doctrine were roused to the necessity of repentance and humiliation before God if Babylon is a great city exalted in their own eyes God's people see themselves as in need of repentance and humiliation many had been halting had been long long been halting between Christ and the world now they felt that it was time to take a stand the things of eternity assumed to them an unwanted reality heaven was brought near and they felt themselves guilty before God <laughs> appreciated the message this morning uh, Frank you know there's a reason why we feel that way it's to keep us building on the rock Christians were quickened to new spiritual life they were made to feel that time was short that what they had to do for their fellow men must be done quickly earth receded eternity seemed to be open before them and the soul with all that pertains to its immortal weal or woe was felt to eclipse every other temporal object the Spirit of God rested upon them what's that that's the maybe the early rain or the early part of the latter rain and gave power to their earnest appeals to their brethren as well as to sinners to prepare for the day of God the silent testimony of their daily life was a constant rebuke to formal and unconsecrated church members these did not wish to be disturbed in their pursuit of pleasure their de devotion to money making and their ambition for worldly honor uh, those are the principles by the way of Babylon pursuit of pleasure money making ambition for worldly honor life liberty and the pursuit of happiness you only get happy by making other people happy that's right hence the enmity and opposition excited against the advent faith and those who proclaimed it so this is Ellen White's view of kind of expanding no, no not strictly a doctrinal list but she's describing a love response or lack thereof she's describing uh, an eager anticipation or distraction or you know the kind of the opposite response that's happening so it brings it more into a more personal realm but also um, transitions to maybe a more um, personal idea you know it's not just a theological you know here's the second angels message it's between the first and the third and here's what we think it means what's the personal application to us so in this experience that happened uh, in 18 around 1844 we see um, the demonstration in the personal lives of those in these churches manifested 
in their churches corporately and then in the Protestant movement at large against the Advent movement. And we see the message being given. We see that um, it's a stumbling block, as Ellen White said, to those who hear it. And in some respects, uh, it, we, we, you know, there's, it's kind of like the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation lost its position uh, as God's um, vehicle to share the gospel. But the individuals, the priests, how many priests were converted in one day? Baptized, you know, 3,000 people baptized in a day. I think thousands of priests becoming uh, converted as well. So the warning is not definitive in the second angel's message that you're hopeless. it's hopeless for you. Because how does the third angel's message open? It's not my job to discuss that too much, but how does it open? Come out, right, um, of her, my people. And certainly in Revelation 18, that's the, that's the way it is. Come out, get out before the destruction is final or fatal. Uh, so again, uh, we see this on a more of a theological, personal level. And if you have a chance, um, go back and read Desire of Ages because Ellen White discusses this in detail in terms of the Jewish experience where Christ is the foundation stone, Christ is the stone of stumbling, Christ is the rock of offense, but what, what produces that? What makes him be those things? Let's look at... Uh, just maybe listen to this. This is from a Desire of Ages. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense, both to the houses of Israel and a gin and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken, be snared and be taken. She's quoting there in Isaiah. And she goes on carried down in prophetic vision to the first advent, the prophet is shown that Christ is to bear trials and tests of which the treatment of the chief cornerstone in the temple of Solomon was symbolic. Maybe you're familiar with that story. The stone that they found didn't seem to fit anywhere. It was unique, uh, but it ended up being tested by all this pressure and weather. And, and then at the moment when they needed to put the cornerstone in they found, well, this is the perfect stone. This is the one that needs to be right here. Then she quotes um, Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In infinite wisdom, God chose the foundation stone and laid it himself. He called it a sure foundation. The entire world may lay upon it their burdens and griefs. It can endure them all. With perfect safety they may build upon it. Christ is a tried stone. Those who trust in him, he never disappoints. He has borne every test. He has endured the pressure of Adam's guilt and the guilt of his posterity and has come off more than a conqueror of the powers of evil. He has borne the burdens cast upon him by every repenting sinner. In Christ, the guilty heart has found relief. He is the sure foundation. All who make him their dependence rest in perfect security. So God's purpose for the stone is rest, peace, security, a solid foundation to build upon. In Isaiah's prophecy, Christ is declared to be both a sure foundation and a stone of stumbling. The apostle Peter, she goes on to quote, if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in its eye in a chief cornerstone. And so first Peter, is, of course, there is quoting again from Isaiah. And he goes on to say, after he quotes the text, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Now Ellen White goes on here in Desire of Ages, page 599, to those who believe, 
Christ is the sure foundation. These are they who fall upon the rock and are broken. Submission to Christ and faith in him are here represented. To fall upon the rock and be broken is to give up our self-righteousness and to go to Christ with the humility of a child, repenting of our transgressions and believing in his forgiving love. And so also it is by faith and obedience that we build on Christ as our foundation. Upon this living stone, Jews and Gentiles alike may build. This is the only foundation upon which we may securely build. It is broad enough for all and strong enough to sustain the weight and burden of the whole world. And by connection with Christ, the living stone, all who build upon this foundation become living stones. Many persons are by their own endeavors hewn, polished, and beautified. But they cannot become living stones because they are not connected with Christ. Without this connection, no man can be saved. Without the life of Christ, listen carefully, without the life of Christ in us, we cannot withstand the storms of temptation. Our eternal safety depends upon our founding, our, our building upon the sure foundation. Multitudes are today building upon foundations that have not been tested. When the rain falls and the tempest rages and the floods come, their houses will fall because they are not founded upon the eternal rock, the chief cornerstone, Christ Jesus. So let's think about, I encourage you to think about the second angel's message in this context. So we've seen the link between the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, the great city. Because, so this, this falling, this stone of stumbling becomes a rock of offense and this is a time of testing. Do we want to have Christ as the living stone? Because he's going to be a stumbling stone for how many? Initially, for everyone, he's a stumbling stone. Does he get in the way of our human trajectory, of our self-interest? He trips us up for the purpose of saying, uh, stop right here. You need to build right here. You know how you feel fallen and, and sinful right now? You feel like you can't do it? That's perfect. Just build on me right now. That is the purpose of the stone of stumbling. He only becomes a rock of offense when we're not uh, getting up seven times like it said in the Psalms, like the righteous man gets up seven times in the Lord's strength, building on him, letting him carry us. But we're getting up and going on in our own way. Oh, well, that was just a small trip. I'll be fine, thank you. The rock just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the trips get, uh, the tripping gets <laughs> more and more traumatic. And so in the end, Babylon has a cosmic fall, if you will. So Let's look at it now from the great controversy kind of picture because there are stories from beginning to end in the great controversy that have this principle of the second angel's message uh, embedded in them. The first one being Lucifer himself. And we, we had a wonderful message, I think, on this and heard a lot about uh, Lucifer's problem. You're familiar with Isaiah Chapter 14, what is his title? What's the title given him in this chapter? Son of the morning. But very specifically, you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So the first, if you will, fall of Babylon relates to Lucifer and his challenge. What was the message that came to him? We heard about this. No, Christ is the sure foundation. Uh, but what became, what was Lucifer's stumbling stone? It was Christ revealed as the um, manifestation of God to the angels. And Lucifer was like, no, I can't live with that. And he ended up with a more permanent fall as he fell out of heaven, if you will. Um, so I don't know that we need to um, 
go over that in great detail, but the text there, um, Isaiah 14, 12, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you weaken the nations? And of course, the text there in Isaiah takes it all the way to the end when his fall is permanent, it is fatal. Okay, uh, let's think a little bit about uh, Cain and Abel. Cain, anyone know what the word Cain means? Why, why uh, Eve called him Cain? Right, a, it means begotten or acquire. I have acquired a son from the Lord. And that's a fitting name for Cain because he wanted to give what he had acquired, right? That's, uh, the story there in Genesis is that in the process of time it came to pass, this is Genesis 4, that uh, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, what he had acquired. Significant because uh, at the fall, the curse slash blessing <laughs> that was given to Adam was what? You're going to have to work to get stuff out of the ground. It's not just going to come like it does in the Garden of Eden. You're going to have to work for it. So Cain is using that as a template for his theology. Got to work hard. What I acquire, I'm going to present. Right? Cain was maybe the first legalist of earthly, uh, well, I suppose Adam and Eve first because it came through them. And then, of course, Abel brought his offering. But God did not respect Cain and his offering. Here comes the stumbling stone. So Cain stumbled because his offering was not respected. Because it didn't represent Christ. And Cain was very angry. His countenance fell. So the Lord sent a message to Cain. Who is the Lord speaking to Cain? Who is the representative to humanity? Jesus. Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire for, is for you, but you shall rule over it. He's reiterating what he told Adam. There's enmity here. I've placed enmity against sin in your heart. You can, you know, through my grace, if you'll pay attention to me, if you'll let me dwell in you, as it were, accept me as your sacrifice, then uh, you can rule over sin rather than it ruling over you. And we know what happened. Uh, Cain uh, chose not to listen to the message, the, the second angel's message, right? Babylon was falling for him. He had listened to the ideas of the king of Babylon, Lucifer, you know, metaphorically speaking there. And he ended up with a curse and then went out into the world. And he, he, he said to the Lord, my punishment, verse 13, is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out of this, out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. All those who through fear of death were held in bondage to sin. Do you see it? He's afraid of dying now because he's on his own. He's not building on the rock. And of course, the Lord, in mercy, prolonged uh, that time for him as well. So he went out, started building cities. And we know what happened uh, in the antediluvian world. The, the principle of self-preservation, self-interest, uh, arose to the point where it became great. And then... It became so forceful. You have the story of Lamech who was bragging to his two wives that somebody offended him, so he killed him. So we have asymmetric response. You know, this is what happens. After the flood, the uh, story of Nimrod is very, very short in Scripture, but interesting. And I'm not sure we have time to do it today. I might touch on a few things, but Matthew Henry has some very interesting insights that he brings out. Matthew Henry has a commentary and in this section. So let me just read the text. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. It's like a saying, right? You're a Nimrod. You're a mighty hunter. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Ah, interesting. Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela. That is the principal city. 
So if you, if you read this, and I, I don't know that um, Matthew Henry is reading between the lines or not, but uh, I, I appreciate what he says. He says, Nimrod is represented as a great man in his day. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, that is, whereas those that went before him were content to stand on the same level with their neighbors. And though every man bore his rule in his own house, yet no man pretended any further. Nimrod's aspiring mind could not rest here. He was resolved to tower above his neighbors, not only to be eminent among them, but to lord it over them. The same spirit that actuated the giants before the flood, who were mighty men, men of renown, now revived in him. So soon was that tremendous judgment which the pride and tyranny of those mighty men brought upon the world forgotten. So soon after the flood, forgetting what had happened. And we see that, of course, in the world today. People who have that kind of attitude. They want to build. They want to rule. And this is part of escaping um, escaping the call of God to worship him. In fact, uh, he goes on, I'll, I'll not read all of this, implicates that he set up idolatry because uh, he was opposed to God. In the Septuagint, if you read the Septuagint of this, he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. So he, his might, he was opposing against the Lord. And in fact, he was a great ruler. When it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Matthew Henry um, suggests that you know he got into power. He laid the foundations of a monarchy, which uh, even um, governments that are not monarchies are often led by one person. In this country, we fortunately have somewhat of a check on power. We have a balance between uh, different parts of government, but this idea of a single ruler being in charge, it brings a certain security, but it also creates opportunity for um, injustice. But the idea was that he was probably the architect in the building of Babel, the Tower of Babel, and that it says, you know, the beginning of his kingdom was these four cities, included Babel, but then when he moved from there, he built four other cities. So you see this idea that his plans were frustrated uh, the stumbling stone tripped up his plans there. Anyway, the, the story and the great controversy goes on. So the reason I bring up Nimrod is that it's likely that he was the first visible ruler of a physical Babylon, right, in this, in this world. And, of course, the most obvious one was Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who ruled when Daniel was taken captive. And you remember the story there? Was Christ a stumbling stone to Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> yes. And uh, he actually repented. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar was converted and wrote part of the book of Daniel, one of the chapters there. His grandson, however, Belshazzar, was uh, more crushed by the stone than... But Daniel reminded him, I won't read the text, Daniel reminded him, about his grandfather, what had happened, and then he said, you, but you willfully forgot this, like Nimrod willfully forgot what happened before the flood. So in the second angel's message, there's a, um, a warning against willful forgetfulness about what God has warned us about. Uh, and then coming down to the Jews, uh, we read much of that uh, passage there in Desire of Ages, and at the end of that, she goes on, to talk about what actually happened with Christ. To them which stumble at the, world being dis at the word being disobedient, Christ is a rock of offense. But the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. Like the rejected stone, Christ in his earthly mission had borne neglect and abuse. He was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But then at the resurrection, he was declared the son of God with power. And then at the second coming, which is how we understand the second angel's message came about um, in our history that everyone would recognize his greatness. So the, before the universe, the rejected stone would become the head of the corner. And then you're, you may be familiar on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. She quotes that. The people who rejected Christ were soon to see their city and their nation destroyed. So the fall, you know, they stumbled, they kept on in their rebellion, but, and he was in, mer in mercy, he sent people to them even after he went to heaven. The, the message of the gospel went, continued to go on. 
Their glory would be broken, scattered as the dust before the wind. And what was it that destroyed the Jews? It was the rock which, had they built upon it, would have been their security. It was the goodness of God despised, the righteousness spurned, the mercy slighted. So in the second angel's message, although it's a negative message, the, the negative message is humanity's, a warning against humanity's response against something very positive, the message of the gospel. And if you reject it, if you reject this rock, that if you build on it would be your security, then it gets bigger and bigger. And uh, she says that the blood shed upon Calvary was the weight that sank them to ruin for this world and the world, world to come. Christ, their rock of offense, will then appear, talking about the end of time, to them as an avenging mountain. It talks about his righteousness, the glory of his countenance will be to the wicked a consuming fire. Because of love rejected, grace despised, the sinner will be destroyed. So the second angel's message harkens back to all of these stories in the Bible. And then prophetically speaking, um, yeah, the bri Christ is the foundation and then there's the rolling stones. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I, we don't have time and the few minutes left to cover all of this, but... Uh, E.J. Wagner in Present Truth UK, he was in the UK, um, has a kind of a nice review of this kind of historical perspective, seeing how the principle of the second angel's message goes through history. Uh, it's actually September 24, 1903. Uh, so you can put that in the context that you need to in terms of his own personal experience. But um, what he says here, I think, he quotes the second angel's message says the message follows the message of the first angel so that this will also go to every na nation and kindred and tongue and people. It is a part, the second angel's message is a part of the everlasting gospel, but it has a special significance in view of the fact that the time has come for the closing work of the gospel. And he goes on to talk about Babylon um, and what it is and uh, also quotes in the 17th chapter of Revelation mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So the link of you know, apostate Protestantism to Mother Church, which we see, of course, being reunited in this day and age. So uh, he talks about th what we read about in the book of Isaiah uh, with Satan being the king of Babylon and how the spirit of Satan is the spirit of the kingdom. Self-exaltation was his ruin. And every at the very attempt to raise self cast Lucifer down from where God had placed him. It's a key principle. Um, and God had him in the highest place that he as a created being could be. When he tried to raise himself higher, he actually fell out of the place where God had him. So in that sense, he was casting himself out of the place where God had placed him. He was casting himself out of heaven said, in seeking to rise, he fell. If he had sought to humble himself, he would have risen. Christ, whom Lucifer envied, thought it not a thing to be tenaciously grasped that he should be equal with God. He gave up all and humbled himself to the death of the cross, wherefore he is highly exalted. The spirit of Satan has always been the characteristic and the destruction of Babylon. In the very beginning of the kingdom, it was there. So he talks about the, the Tower of Babel and how when they really got that spirit going, then it became their destruction and the Lord scattered them. And then he goes on to talk about Nebuchadnezzar whose kingdom was based in that same area and had the same experience as we talked about. Then he goes on to say, quoting um, Revelation, He's, uh, he quotes it in a minute, he says, once more when Babylon the Great is drunk with power and earthly glory, when her sinful ambitions are all realized, when all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath for fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, then in her, in her hour of triumph falls once again the voice from heaven. Come out of her, my people, that ye may be not partaker of her, of her sins, that, she, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So it's almost like you see this tower building, tower of sins. And he uh, goes on to say, the text goes on to say, reward her even as she has rewarded you and double unto her according to her works and um, you know, have her drink the cup. 
In the message of the second angel, this is Wagner again, we learn that to all outward appearance, Babylon is prospering greatly. All nations are serving her. Her triumph seems assured. Opposi opposition seems hopeless. Yet God's servants are to declare aloud, so we're to declare aloud, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, even though it looks very successful. And he says this, I think this is a keeper. It is when Babylon triumphs that she falls. It is when Babylon triumphs that she falls. We should never be discouraged when evil seems to be victorious. And he's, he goes on to talk about that there are prisoners in Babylon that need to be set free. The message of the second angel goes with the everlasting gospel to get men perfectly free from Satan's power. It means entire deliverance from every yoke of bondage. It means having power over all the power of the enemy. Satan has bound many as he bound the woman who was bowed down by a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. But this message will give deliverance from all such bondage to those who take it by faith. While Satan appears to be triumphing in the earth, while the churches unite with the world in rejecting the law of God and denying the faith of Christ, believers will with gladness and confidence declare the glad tidings that Babylon has fallen. Under the theology, under the experience of Christianity in Babylon, there is no freedom. There is no victory. So the second angel's message is actually an encouragement. There is freedom. Babylon has fallen. You can go free. You can go free in Christ. A.T. Jones um, talks about this. Here's what he's saying. This is in 1892. Then by the ministry of the apostles there was made known that which had been hid from ages and from generations, and that thing was the mystery of God. And by preaching of the gospel, says the word, he would now make known to his saints what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Though it had been hid from ages and generations in the past, now the Lord breaks off the veil, brings it forth, and by the mouth of the apostles and the preaching of the gospel spreads it before all nations for the obedience of faith. This is the gospel, and the preaching of this is the preaching of the gospel. So connection with Christ, building on the stone, the rock, the mystery of godliness, how God can make us living stones, how he can indwell us as he did Christ. So then he, he goes on to make a contrast between this um, mystery of the gospel. And I'm not going to read all of this, uh, this slide. But God was removing the veil that kept us from that experience by sending Christ to have God be able to reveal himself in us. But in contrast, there was the mystery of iniquity that then was already working according to the apostles. And the mystery of iniquity was, if you will, the opposite of the mystery of God. So rather than building on the stone, becoming a living stone, the mystery of iniquity was, you don't need that. You can, um, you can continue living without relying on God. So we don't have time to, um, I think we're about out of time, but I encourage you to read the rest of this. Um, again, the reference is A.T. Jones, um, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, 482, 483, and 1892, August 2. The, the, the main idea here uh, that he brings out, one of the main ideas is that the second angel's message in Revelation 14 was given, but then it's repeated again in Revelation 18, uh, in the first part, as part of the louder proclamation of the everlasting gospel. So, I hope you see the connection here between the why the that Babylon has this stumbling stone and rock of offense. But uh, just in closing, I'll bring it home. Uh, Ellen White has this, I um, encourage you to read this uh, entirely if you have the chance. Was the blessing cherished? She wrote this in February 6, 1894, Review of Herald, Review and Herald. And she's kind of looking back at the previous year, 1893. 
and this experience post Minneapolis, it's evident. Um, and she talks about this. Unto you therefore which who believe he is a precious, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. So she's quoting Peter there, but in the rest of the article she goes on to apply that to us, to our experience corporately after Minneapolis. And then um, to bring it to a, a personal note, A.R. Henry, she's writing to, and she wrote to others with similar language, uh, G.I. Butler, Uriah Smith, others who had trouble with the message of righteousness by faith, they stumbled at the rock, at the stone of stumbling, and she was pleading with them not to let them make it a fatal fall, uh, a, a rock of offense that would crush them. Under the gracious influence of God, you have often felt the moral obligations devolving upon you, but after the influence you received at the Minneapolis meeting, where it was popular to talk doubt, to question and resist the light God was sending, that's one of the principles of Babylon. It's, it's popular to talk doubt, to question and resist the light. The sediments there suggested one to another acted upon your mind and heart like a poisonous malaria. Although every evidence that was essential was given in regard to the work which the Lord had begun in behalf of his people, although those present felt the convicting power of God upon heart and mind, they did not possess humility of heart to the acknowledging of the truth. They stumbled, but... They didn't get up in humility. They got up in self-confidence. They revealed that more evidence would accomplish nothing for them. It was not evidence they needed, for this had been abundant. They needed meekness and lowliness of heart to confess. Had you yielded your pride and self-sufficiency then, you would have softened your heart and been converted. But you kept your feet in the path of unbelief. You hated the messages sent from heaven. You manifested against Christ a prejudice of the very same character and more offensive to God than that of the Jewish nation. How offensive? More offensive than that of the Jewish nation. Nothing but spiritual blindness could so obscure your discernment that you would not see the working of the Spirit of God. You did see it, but you would not yield to it. And she goes on. This is your stumbling block, unbelief which no one but yourself can remove. It doesn't mean that Christ is removed. He can be built on as a foundation stone. That's what she's appealing for. But in the path of unbelief, Christ keeps showing up as the stumbling block to save us from the final fatal fall of Babylon. Because of your false ideas, you cannot obtain a right understanding of what is truth and what constitutes the third angel's message. Had this blind obstinacy in you been yielded, you would have humbled your heart and received the greatest blessing you ever had in your life. Oh, what a terrible thing it is for anyone to be deceived and deluded by Satan. So, we're, many of us, most of us, maybe all of us here, Seventh-day Adventists, we're called to proclaim the three angels' messages. So there's the first angel's message, and there's the second angel's message, and the third angel's message. The second angel's message is a test. And uh, we're still in that testing time. Because the righteousness of Christ, the first angel's message, uh, even the third angel's message in verity was presented. But until the whole is presented as a unity, until we stop stumbling over the rock of offense, and build on the rock Jesus Christ. Let him live in us, become living stones. The message won't go forward with that power. It's not bad news, it's good news. God is doing everything he can to trip us up. You know, if you trip and fall right before the step that would have taken you over the cliff, but you tripped and fell and then you saw the, the fatal flaw that would come. Wouldn't that be a blessing? So God, in a sense, in the second angel's message, is giving us encouragement that I'm here. Babylon won't save you. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And uh, we not only really need to come out of Babylon, call other peoples out of Babylon. As someone has said, we need Babylon taken out of us.
So that's my prayer for each of us today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is everything that you've said he is. A stumbling stone. Yes, even a rock of offense. But his desire is to be that living foundation stone that we might build upon, that we might have life, have it more abundantly, be built into a temple of living stones that we might corporately uh, show your power and your grace, your mercy to the world, that the call might be effective, that you might have a people a large reward that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.